I am gasping for breath as I cycle up East Heath Road, a steep hill that leads from the Royal Free Hospital up to Whitestone Pond in Hampstead. On the pavement to my left is a man and two young children pushing scooters. Between my audible gasps, I hear the boy say to his father, what is the greatest hero on earth? Without missing a beat, the man replies, God. And the boy, as quickly, without turning round, says dismissively, well, that cannot be right. And I lose the rest of the conversation as I rotate the pedals and crawl up the hill. I should be more interested in the man's answer but I can't help but reflect on the interrogative, what, rather than the more correct who. Did the boy anticipate the answer, God? Perhaps thinking that the question, what is the greatest hero on earth, might make his respondent think not of a human hero, but the invisible presence of some thing, some whatness beyond human imagination, a thing that cannot be seen, heard, or grasped. I thought about this question on Thursday when I received the very sad news of the death of one of this country's foremost Jewish historians, Professor Ada Rappaport Albert, the Israeli-born British scholar and academic, whose teaching at University College in London when I was a rabbinic and later on an MA student there, had such an immense influence on the direction of my own special interest of study. Ada, who was head of the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies and latterly Professor Emerita, was quite simply an extraordinary individual. Tall, striking, with long, dark and later gray hair that reached below her waist, there was something darkly Gothic about her appearance, heavily made up eyes and dark, almost purple lipstick, long, usually black flowing robes that concealed a slender form and she often wore heavy black boots. She was formidable, not because of her appearance, but because of her forensic and brilliant scholarship. And she was quite simply an inspiring, exacting teacher and communicator. Ada's academic area of study lay in the field of Jewish mysticism. She oversaw a project on the linguistic and literary context of the Zohar, the foremost medieval text of the Jewish mystical tradition. And she was a historian of Hasidism contributing to the field of gender studies within the movement and the development of the Chabad movement, also known as the Lubavitch sect within Hasidism. In 2013, she published an article on the changing role of women within the Chabad movement in the late 19th and 20th century, about the same time that the liberal movement was developing and was founded. Chabad or Lubavitch was founded by Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi in the latter part of the 18th century. Over two centuries, it was led by a dynasty of Rebbe's, the last being the seventh Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, some of whose followers controversially declared him to be the Messiah after his death in New York in 1994. The Chabad movement today is different in some respects from other Hasidic sects on three counts. The role it gives to women, its outreach work through Chabad houses, which are all over the world, and its messianism. Originally, the Hasidic movement was cre created of associations, and these groups were exclusively for men. The Rebbe's would hold court in their hometowns, 
and men would abandon their wives and children to great economic hardship in order to go and sit at the feet of these teachers who were great and charismatic men. Women could not be Hasidim in their own right. They were simply their wives and daughters. But towards the end of the first decade of the 20th century, the wife of the fifth Rebbe, the Rebetzin Shterna Sara, 1860 to 1942, launched a fundraising campaign targeting women in the Chabad fold throughout the Russian Empire. The money was to be used for very traditional purposes to educate boys and young men in a yeshiva. But this was the very first time that women had been targeted within the Hasidic movement in their own right. Sarah's son, Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, who died in 1950, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, took a very different stance from his more conservative father, who had castigated women for allowing religious observance to become lax. And instead, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Yosef Yitzchak, positioned women at the forefront of a campaign to increase piety and to create a religious revival of observance. He even allowed women to study some of the teachings of the Chabad movement, an unprecedented development in the history of the Chabad, or in the history of Hasidism. After his death, the dynasty was inherited by his son-in-law, the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who went even further in his recognition of women as part of the Hasidic movement, creating associations of women and enabling them to function as emissaries together with their husbands. Reading some of the writings of the last two Rebbe's, Yosef Yitzchak and Menachem Mendel, I was struck by a certain similarity between the changing roles of 20th century Chabad women and the associations of which they became a part and their direct contemporary, the founder of our own liberal Jewish movement in 1902, Lily Montague, who undertook her own deeply spiritual quest for God through prayer, social service, and also through creating associations, group activities. Of course, these two movements, Chabad and liberal Judaism, arose in very different geographical and social environments. But there is something striking about the comparison of the leadership of the Chabad movement and an English Jewish woman raised in privileged households part of dynastic, wealthy Jewish upper bourgeoisie families with important connections to the secular authorities of the time. And both those movements had that, the individuals concerned. Unfortunately, there isn't time for me to compare these interesting historical developments, but consider these two statements on the subjects of faith and education. Here is the first, and I quote, faith is a product of the home and the responsibility of imparting it rests primarily with the mother who has her children almost entirely to herself at the most impressionable age of their existence, which is before they reach the age of six. Women's contribution to religion is in the field of religious education, in the creation of permanent peace, and in the quickening of the moral sense of her own life and in the lives of those whom she can influence." End of quote. Here's the second new quotation. In the life of the Jewish family, before providing the children with a Torah education, it is necessary to speak to their mothers. Jewish women, the fate of our children is in your hands, their whole future, good or heaven forbid, bad, depends on their education. And the heavy burden of their education 
rests entirely on you. Of course, both these quotations are of their time. The first from Lily Montague's undated paper, Women's Contribution to the Spiritual Life of Humanity. The second quotation and an address to the women in Riga by the sixth Rebbe, Josef Yitzhak, in 1934. But note how both place the responsibility for moral education of children and their spiritual piety in the hands of women. It is striking that both Lily Montague and the Hasidic movement in its 20th century incarnation see women as a major force in resisting the germs of secularism, which I quote, threaten to annihilate God. And the similarities go further beyond faith and education to outreach and social work. We know that Lily Montague worked with children and young working women in the East End of young, London. She encouraged her, her girls, as she called them, to become observant, to serve God through service, to find meaning and purpose in prayer, in Shabbat and festival observance. And when the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe succeeded his father-in-law, he began to mobilize women more actively in service to the movement as emissaries themselves, sent out with their husbands as part of an international outreach mission to spread Jewish knowledge, religious observance, and loyalty to the Chabad movement. In a striking similarity, Lily Montague, in her autobiographical memoir, The Faith of a Jewish Woman, speaks of, and I quote, my world, my beautiful human world, lighted up by the flame of God in its midst. While the fifth Rebbe writes of relationships to be pierced by the flame of God. In many respects, of course, liberal Judaism and the Chabad movement moved in opposite directions, one embracing progressive revelation, the other teaching that Torah was given on Sinai in an unbroken chain of tradition. But in these areas of education, passionate faith, and the empowerment of women through associations specifically for women, as well as through individual influence, there is an uncanny, although perhaps not coincidental similarity. And in one other respect as well, liberal Judaism and the Chabad movement shared a fervent approach to redemption. Yosef Yitzchak wrote, women have a special redemption, special relationship to the redemption. Our sages said, by virtue of the righteous women of that generation, Israel were redeemed when they came out of Egypt. By the same token, it was said about the future redemption, that it would come by virtue of the righteous women of that generation. Chabad, like all expressions of orthodoxy, never denied the future coming of the Messiah. In fact, it was Menachem Mendel, as I said earlier, who was seen by his followers as an embodiment of a messianic figure, Mashiach, the one who would lead the people towards redemption. While liberal Judaism no longer accepted the idea of a personal Messiah, Lily Montague nevertheless expressed her belief in redemption and the symbolic power of the Messiah in these remarkable words. We cannot conceive of any human being with power to lead the world as a Messiah would with its multitude of conflicting tendencies to abiding peace and happiness. It is nevertheless, she adds, a principle of Judaism that each individual can be a messiah or messenger of God, working for righteousness and together bringing nearer the dawn of the perfect day when the highest aspirations, human aspirations, 
will be satisfied. What an extraordinary statement from an enlightened woman at the beginning of the 20th century. It was the little boy pushing his scooter up the hill with his question, what is the greatest hero on earth? His father's response, God, and the death of Professor Ada Rappaport Albert that prompted this reflection on two apparently polarized but profoundly connected movements, Hasidism and liberal Judaism. And perhaps indeed, they came out of the same ruptures within the religious development of Judaism as far back as the 18th century. And there is no doubt that both Lily Montague and the early development of liberal Judaism and the Hasidic movement share something that might bring us strength and insight in our current environment, a profound longing and love for God expressed through the practice of prayer and contemplation, active service and the pursuit of truth and righteousness. Kain Yehirat Son, may this be God's will and let us say, Amen.